Welcome to today's webinar, Complex Digital Data Calls for a New Breed of Data Hunters. My name is Jen, and I will be in the background answering any WebEx technical questions. If you experience technical difficulties within the WebEx session, you may also contact WebEx Technical Support at 166 3239 Please, but as an attendee, you are part of a larger audience. However, due to privacy rights, we have chosen not to display the number or list of attendees to all on the call. Attendees will remain in list and only note throughout the presentation today. And as a reminder, today's call is being recorded. We'll be holding a Q&A session at the conclusion of today's presentation. You can online question anytime throughout by simply clicking on the Q&A panel located in the lower right corner of your screen. If you do not see the Q&A panel in the lower right corner, please click on the question mark icon at the top of the right side. Please put your questions into the text field and hit send. Leave the drop down option as all panelists. I would now like to introduce Carolyn Casey, Director of Industry Relations at Access Data. Please go ahead. Thank you so much um, and welcome everybody. We are thrilled to have you here today. Um, my name is Carolyn, as uh, she mentioned, and I'm an attorney. I work at uh, Access Data uh, as director, Senior Director of Industry Relations, and I have been in the industry and information governance and management industry for about uh, 10 or 12 years, um, and I get to follow trends that impact our customers and bring them, hopefully bring them some insight and thought leadership in those areas as well as help the company here with the strategy. In a moment, I introduce our wonderful panel of speakers who are with us uh, today. But we are we are glad you are here. Thanks for coming. And anything else you wanted to say before we move on? Not at all. Thank you. Uh, we do have a lot of great content for you, by the way, today. And we want to have the experts have to give their case studies, which they've prepared. So. It may not have time for questions, but please do send questions. We'll be sure to get back to you via email if we don't get to them uh, today. So welcome to this webinar. Um, we're going to talk about this new breed data hunter that is taking over um, IT and InfoSec at, at corporations, um, surviving and managing through this deluge of digital investigation, we're calling for what we're, call we're, we're pointing the new primal hunting and gathering instinct. Um, we see getting asked by lots of different corporate teams to quickly find uh, information so they can analyze it. Uh, they need to look across networks and devices and all sorts of different data sources uh, to pull up data for an investigation or a regulatory inquiry or e discovery. Um, this is really calling for kind of a new type of hunter, uh, uh, as we call them, uh, who helps these teams uh, with their investigations. Today we'll walk through, I'll introduce the panelists. They talk about um, the new hunter breed and the evolution they see happening uh, for that role and for the organizations today. And we'll talk about how the hunter interacts with the tribe, maybe and frequently, legal, HR, clients, and other groups that need their investigative uh, help. And we'll move into case studies where the panelists will share some details on uh, three different case studies to give you some practical insight on managing all of this. Pleasure to introduce what has just been a wonderful team of folks to get to know um, your speakers today. Um, I'll start by introducing uh, Jason Britton of iHeart Media, uh, formerly of, of, of uh, Aramco. And Jason is an IT technical engineer at iHeart uh, Media. He's worked with a number of companies as an expert in incident response. He's done policy development and training, incident response investigations, with forensics, uh, malware research extensive career um, in this area, and he really, um, has a passion about data security and the technology that supports it. Uh, he is really are this new breed that we're talking about and celebrating in a way here today. Uh, and Jason holds numerous um, certifications, as you can see there. Mason, I'm also no, going to now introduce John, uh, gonna introduce John um, of the Verizon Risk Team. Um, and uh, John is the investigative response team lead there, um, and also, interestingly, the primary author of a great study, um, the Verizon Data Breach Digest. Uh, Mr. Green, uh, brings 14 years of experience in conducting digital forensic investigations with both the government and civilian security sectors. 
uh, and John um, is on the, the the risk team providing services to clients, uh, not to Verizon itself. He leads a team of highly trained technical digital investigators. Um, he responds to cyber-related security incidents, on-site threat um, mitigations, uh, breach research, containment activities, um, you name it. Um, he, too, is one of these new data hunters and, um, and analyzers. Also, welcome to John Wilson um, of Discovery Squared, um, of that company. He is a licensed private investigator, certified forensic examiner, and information technology veteran. John brings two decades of experience um, working with uh, the U.S. government, public and private companies, and he's um, clients in many different industries as a trusted advisor to law firms, corporate legal departments, outside counsel and executives on best practices for litigation readiness. So, again, we're really fortunate to have this um, team of experts. Let's see what talk a bit about um, What's going on inside uh, corporations um, in the area of digital forensics, forensic investigations of data? Um, there's a lot of external internal forces that have really kind of pushed the corporate uh, investigations to change and evolve. We'll have the panel comment on what's driving that change, and then tell us about this new breed of the hunters. What do they look like? Um, uh, John Wilson. We have two Johns today, by the way, so you'll, you're been calling them by their last name. Um, so, Wilson, um, what kind of solution um, in enterprise digital forensics um, are you seeing? And can you talk about this new breed a little bit? Um, what group inside corporations do they sit in? Um, who do they report to? Um, what are they all about? What are you seeing there, John Wilson? So, you know, the, the, the industry changing. Being, uh, evolving as you know, technology continues to evolve, and and data sets have gotten to tremendous sizes, uh, where you know a, an average computer can have a two terabyte hard drive and, and be filled with uh, content that needs to be searched. And in addition to that, you have the complexities as businesses have evolved, and the eatery requests have have continued to grow and you know originally it was you know a little uh, IP theft and uh, you know responses to now you've got to deal with malware you got to find and identify malware and, and prevent the zero day exploits within your company network you have to prevent data leakage from the organization, so it's no longer just an HR and a legal thing. You, you've got compliance departments that have to handle government requests. You have departments from all over the organization that now suddenly have e-discovery needs. They've got to find out what documents have, what documents have been distributed or accessed, and, and the stack of documents has gotten 20 times the size that it was just five years ago. So, uh, uh, exactly, and there's there's privacy regulations, um, and data protection. Um, there's cybersecurity regulations now. There's you know personally identifiable information needs to be protected. It just seems like there's a lot of um, forces, um, regulatory area impacting this too. Um, yes, yeah, for that perspective, um, John. Maybe we'll turn to. Uh, John Graham of, of um, Verizon. John, um, what do you see as the, the new technical challenges um, that um, investigators are facing inside corporations? Um, how do they overcome them? What kinds of technology and tools might they be able to work with in, as this new um, hunter-gatherer? Sure. Um, actually, one of the biggest challenges, and I think it was just mentioned a little bit earlier here, is the sheer amount of data that is potentially involved Ways, and in particular, data breach cases. Um, you know, with hard drives storing more and more data, and with more systems storing data, um, one of the days where we can just simply uh, um, a hard drive out of a system, uh, do a bit image and analyze it, works with servers, multiple servers that we need to go ahead and and scope down, triage down, and focus on which servers are going to be the most um, uh, eligible in terms of the forensic analysis. Uh, the thing is probably the environment. 
um, when I first started out doing digital forensic investigations, we were doing a lot of dead box, dead box collection and dead box uh, analysis. Now we're faced with doing uh, collect live environments, and the live environments collection is that's required in the system. If you're doing PI investigations, you've got to get that live system image and volatile data. Um, or you can't necessarily shut down the servers that are involved. They're, they're needed for business purposes. So you've got to be able to adapt and tools that can go ahead and collect against those live systems. In terms of also are the operating systems. Are you dealing with Linux machines, Windows machines, various different versions uh, of Windows machines, Macintosh. Uh, um, it's even mobile devices, so you have to be very flexible and have a toolkit that can cover down on those different types of operating systems and different types of things themselves. And then more in terms of environments, uh, the location is a challenge. Are you going to be able to go on site and collect, or do you have to do the collection remotely? And if you do collection remotely, you certainly have challenges there with throughput in terms of data speeds and the capacity of, of putting that data across the wire. And then probably the third uh, technical challenge is it's not really a technical challenge, but it's the challenge of working with um, all kinds of different other stakeholders, technical and non-technical stakeholders, different backgrounds, and more specifically, uh, different uh, roles and responsibilities within the incident response um, that you find yourself in. Legal issues are involved. Corporate communications are involved. Human resources as well as T-Security. So everybody has a role to play. So it's longer just focusing on that hard disk drive and doing the analysis. It's actually working with everybody else to get them the information they need so they can perform jobs. So I probably Great. the biggest challenges. Sounds um, like a, a couple of great uh, insights there. Thanks, both of you, for that perspective. Um, and we'll we'll pick up on what John was just talking about there, and and talk about the and the tribe, um, the, the stakeholders that they um, work with and they serve their internal almost their internal customers, um, and what's been changing there. And um, Jay, we go to you on this. Um, we can talk a little bit about um, how the digital investigative team works with uh, the stakeholders, aka the tribe. You know what what kind of communications goes on? Um, how is data shared? Um, what, how does this tribe all work together efficiently? And maybe if you see some, some bikes or, or places maybe that where efficiency um, gains could be had, um, you know, comment on those two if you will. Well, yeah, we do. Um, well, I mean, the, the communications has is, is been a big problem for a lot of the different groups you work in. Just because there's not a policy to find, there's not a lot of experience in working with this huge level of like they were, John was speaking previously, the huge amount of data we're dealing with, the huge amount of, you know, the shift from dead box to live box, the shifts from we can't leave the, you know, we can't kill the servers to the servers have to stay on. It's just, it's a complete shift in the way we do investigations, and it's a complete shift in the way we have to communicate uh, all the different teams and stakeholders, and from HR to legal to uh, external investigative entities as needed to uh, certs to uh, the collecting data from vendors to getting vendors involved in our investigations. It's a, um, it's a whole game in the communications that are necessary. We have to be able to be consistent and in our communications of what we need, what we want, what's what's expected of, as our deliverables from uh, from our fixed work and from our investigation of work. Because uh, again, it's the data difference is so huge that it makes it hard to communicate to some of these traditional entities what we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. When we're more different things like, you know, um, Internet streets, it, it's a totally different game now than it used to be. You know, just one browser on one computer. It's multiple browsers, mobile devices. Uh, it can be on the thumb drive. It can be a thousand different places. And it just makes our hunting and getting all the needs and uh, info back and forth just all the more difficult. Indeed, great, uh, great comments there. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, you know, one of the things that um, Sharon, was an, an analyst with Forrester, observed um, actually yesterday, um, um, that I was sitting in on, um, she, she commented on, on the, the um, growing extension of e-discovery technology um, beyond legal um, to help 
uh, finance and HR and others see patterns and gain insights from enterprise data. Um, and in fact, we've had requests to train HR and, and audit um, folks on using discovery technology, um, whether it's um, email analysis and, and being able to see uh, communication patterns uh, between multiple um, custodians or potential custodians or using some of the analytics, even to get insights about the data pool that you have to um, analyze. Uh, John, can you talk about this a little bit? Are you seeing uh, if HR, other groups starting to use e-discovery technology or looking at that now or in the future? On Wilson, sorry. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the HR, legal, compliance, all of them are, are, are getting significantly more interested and they want to see those data maps and they want to see the, the communication, the timelines and the communication patterns, who's talking to who. They, it, it, it's becoming much more important as these, these data volumes have increased to such a substantial level that you don't have time to review 80 bytes of data in order to complete a case. You have to start figuring out, hey, here, here's my point of entry for whatever incident has occurred, and I've got to start mapping around that. And so you've got to be using these technologies to really build and define those maps and then deliver it to a compliance or legal, whichever division you're dealing with and providing that information to, because the ones that are going to have the context to then say, okay, oh, we, we see that the, the data is moving from here to there, so now we're interested in this data over here, whereas, you know, says the hunters, you know, we need that guidance because, the, again, the data volumes have gotten so large, it's, it's hard to stay, you know, linear and just walk through all the data. There's no longer the time for that. Yeah, it's an iterative process where the person needs the information might look at some early um, batches and say, hey, in this email I noticed um, this guy was also mentioned. Have we collected his data or can you get me some more information? Um, this repository where we found lots of data on X, Y, and Z. Um, really, because I do want to move to the case studies, but um, how are um, the um, compliance officers and um, VPs of HR or, or folks in an ethics and compliance group, once the um, investigation is complete, uh, you have done maybe a forensic collection and done some forensic analysis, um, how do you give the data over uh, to the folks that need to get it and how do they look at it if they don't have an e-discovery technology? How do they rapidly go through the files, preserving metadata, et cetera? Could, could, um, Something and comment on that. I Maybe. yeah, I can certainly do that. And that's um, you know uh, again, you know, in you know ten years ago it was hey, here's my report. It was all printed out in paper, and I handed them the report, and they would dig through it, read through it, and say that's what I was interested in. Great. Today again, those volumes are so huge that you really do have to start and evaluating the technology and figuring out a way of, you know, hey, now I can push my whole report or my timeline to their review interface, whatever that may be, and, you know, figuring out those technological ways of handling those things so that you can then, again, it's finding a needle within a haystack of needles. So you've got to have something that allows them to run that rabbit hole without having to go through that linear approach. And they can't do it in paper anymore. It's got to be digital. It's got to be electronic. You got to have a re review platform or a data platform to transmit that information and allow them to see that, review that, uh, in order to be effective and efficient. Time. Yeah, yeah. We, we really see is is the data needs to be found quickly so it can get to analysis. Because the folks looking at the screen here, they're all under pressure to respond. Uh, to a um, request from a regulator or a very sensitive matter. Um, so, feeding the process, um, keeping it risk, uh, risk, managing the risks throughout it and getting them the data they need and then having tools to analyze it. See where we see a lot of evolution and change going on. All right, well, let's shift into um, our next session here, which is um, we're going to bring you some uh, down and dirty insights into a couple of um, use cases almost. Um, and the panelists will set the text for you, um, as you see on the slide, uh, first slide there. Um, and walk you through the situation, uh, a specific investigation that um, they were involved in or that they've um, to, to uh, 
it's the innocent. Um, they'll talk about the workflow and the stakeholders and the challenges and the approaches that were used, and then we share with you kind of takeaways, lessons learned, and things maybe you could apply. So, um, John Grimm of, of Verizon, um, I'll turn over to you uh, for your case study. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, as you can see here, I've got a slide here for cyber espionage threat actions, and what I want to do is was concentrate on a scenario that, that, that we've seen in the past um, involving content management systems. And uh, for those not familiar with content management systems, uh, these are ubiquitous. They're used for various different purposes, um, such as publishing or modifying content, organizing data, or even managing users. So you can see here with this slide is uh, the cyber uh, espionage threat actions. And we have a particular scenario involving a CMS compromise a lot of these underlying um, threat actions here. What I wanted to show you is, uh, in terms of espionage, what we see a lot of times is a uh, complexity that involves a hacker, uh, involves malware. It usually involves some kind of social engineering, as you can see that phishing right there is number three. Um, and that malware is specialized. It usually has some kind of command control component to it or a backdoor, uh, steals credentials. Um, so this particular scenario I chose is the side espionage. And incidentally, um, in terms of uh, uh, threat motivations, um, look at our caseload. Uh, espionage is second only to financial motivation. So 80% of the data breaches that we've seen over the years have a financial motivation behind it, and that have espionage. So this scenario um, involves a, a CMS compromise, and this has elements of both cyber espionage as well as a financial motivation. And in this particular situation, um, the CMS, which is, as I mentioned, very ubiquitous, uh, was targeted by threat actors. And the, for the scenario here, we looked at the Roman holiday. And this involved actual real-world pirates who were attacking a global shipping conglomerate's uh, cargo. And the victims actually noticed a change in tactics from these pirates. They noticed that they weren't attacking, attacking ships at random, um, blocked the crew or, or the crew locking themselves up for safety purposes all day while the, the, the pirates had run through the cargo crates. The tactics involved targeted attacks. It seemed like specific vessels were targeted, specific cargo uh, targeted, specific containers were, were targeted within shipping vessels. And the also notice this too, because normally they would lock themselves in, in a room uh, and be there all day until the pirates would leave, but it, it didn't, it's like the pirates were getting on and getting off the ship very quickly. Only specific uh, types of cargo was targeted, and it turns out these were value crates containing diamonds, jewelry, valuables. So digital forensic investigators were called in to determine if there was any kind of digital angle behind this targeted attack by these modern pirates. And as it turns out, when we looked at this situation, we were dealing with content management systems. And in particular, uh, what we started to do is we started to focus in on how would the, the information be gained by these potential pirates to, to know specifically what vessels to target, specifically what part to target. And it turns out what we ended up having to do was we took an approach that involved what we see many times nowadays in terms of data breaches. A uh, attack needs complex methodology. So it's just uh, collecting images of servers that we suspected were involved. What we did was we set up a network forensics capability. Uh, we were able to, to capture packets. We were able to look at NetFlow. We were able to look at network logs and narrow down to a specific server that looked like it was involved uh, or was being led uh, by these pirates uh, for the attack. And so what we did was we collected logs, NetFlow data, packet captures, we also collected system images, and we collected volatile data as well. And in addition to that, we had a malware reverse engineer on on, on end, uh, looking at any malware that we found. Um, just so term, th it turns out that these, uh, these threat actors were le leveraging a digital component where they were having uh, someone go in and hack into this, uh, this environment, get into these content management servers, and access this data, uh, things such as shipping routes, the schedules of ships, the inventories, and the bills of lading, and we're exfiltrating this information by way of malware that they have installed on the computer systems, 
and we're feeding that information to these pirates who are leveraging it for targeted attacks on certain vessels. So this is a good example of a complex situation where we wouldn't really have the time to sit and image a whole bunch of systems, and then maybe a week after we're completed, our imaging start looking at it. We needed to go into a live environment, capture work data, capture endpoint uh, data, capture volatile data, and then look at any malware that we found. And it turns out that the malicious actors, the digital threat actors, uh, had a, a malicious web shell that they were running commands. In, uh, the malicious web shell allowed uh, to upload and download data. And that included, as I mentioned, those bills of lading, uh, the freight numbers, the vessel numbers, and the shipping schedules. So another thing, too, I wanted to point out with this particular scenario, and it's something that we see all the time with our data breaches, is the job just isn't over after we collect and start doing analysis. What we need to do is feed real-time uh, advice and guidance to the victims in terms of containment, eradication of malware, and remediation of the systems, as well as recovery. In this particular case, we had to advise the customer to take certain systems offline, offline I should say. We um, advised the customer to go ahead and block the threat actor IP address. Uh, we advised the customer or the victim to reset compromised passwords, uh, to rebuild those certain CMS systems that we had identified as being compromised, and also advised that they implement periodic vulnerability scans and then to take a more formalized uh, patch management approach. So what we did was we advised um, from start to finish how the, the, the victim can get themselves back on their feet again and hopefully prevent or mitigate this type of situation from occurring uh, in the future. So a really, really good example, I thought, of, uh, of the complexities that, are, that we're faced with in terms of threat actors, in terms of the environments that we have to work in, as well as the speed with which, with which we have to operate to only, not only collect but also parse the data and the data and give timely uh, feedback back to the victim so that they can go and combat, combat the situation or the sector that they're currently facing. So I think um, yeah. that brings me in there, Carolyn. That is um, really fascinating. Thanks so much for sharing um, sure. that analogy of an incident response. And um, the pirate factor, I'm, I'm picturing um, guys with hats on and black patches on their eyes. So color, <laughs> too. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, You're welcome. Okay. And thank you. We'll, we'll move now um, on to uh, kind of a human resource uh, case study example um, from Jason. Jason, take away. All right. Well, I was, uh, you know, a little bit piratey, um, but it's not from a vector we expected. Again, maybe we should have done our research a little better. Uh, we came to find out, you know, like the slide shows, a um, large percentage of uh, attacks were carried out by insiders. We had properly re prepared. Our company wasn't prepared. We didn't have procedures in place. So uh, it's all started with uh, an alarm uh, from our SIM, post SOC guys, about the, uh, uh, just a simple, you know, potential one-in program. Just it was one of those awareness things, not really anything. Um, we sit down, found it was on a thumb drive, uh, found it was an unapproved thumb drive. That started setting off some uh, alarm bells and whistles in the right places. Uh, we start, we were asked by management to begin tracking the person's uh, usage, pull a basic you know, of what they've been doing with drives and their basic activity on the web recently. Um, so we reported to HR that we were needing to do this investigation. They contacted legal, legal sent the head and we brought them in uh, with all the details and gave them an initial report. Then began the user's activities and found that he had been brought regularly on uh, job hunting sites, uh, email an awful lot, and also plugging in uh, multiple devices from home while adding network shares. So this set off a lot of uh, a lot of arms for us. In turn, we began doing a packet captures on all the data going to and from his uh, station. Uh, began daily um, loads of information up to uh, management. Began and turned on a, a new tool we got that allowed us to track every file that was written to or read from a thumb drive on the endpoint device. We a whole lot easier. We were actually able to establish exactly what files he was copying, which turned out to be um, private files and databases of customer data data, 
and uh, research data that should not have been leaving the company and was confidential. So as we gathered all this data, then it became, you know, time to decide how to present it to legal and HR. Um, we didn't have a good um, simple for it, and it was a lot of data, so it became a very manual process. I had a proper e-discovery tool in place for this, but we presentation of data to legal it was finally brought into law enforcement, and then started learning that our company didn't have the policy procedures in place to properly, so to speak. So it took a lot more digging on our end to properly get it handled by the police. But aimed to our biggest takeaways from the whole thing was we didn't have a proper policy in place and procedure for how to handle thumb drives, how to handle internal investigations, and properly work with law enforcement on handling those. We thought we had all this marvelous incident response, and we thought we had all this marvelous stuff. All the data we had to dig out, we couldn't print in the proper way, couldn't correlate it properly. It was taking a lot of extra hours to do. For us, it showed um, that we can trust our employees. You know, we can't trust them that much, and we didn't have the proper mitigation logging policies in place for quick mediation. It took us weeks to do the investigation while the user was siphoning out data. It ended up with we found out the user was hunting for a new job and had been offered a job at the place he was looking at if he could bring over certain amounts, certain kinds of data. So it was a very um quite deal he was working through overall. So I guess it came down to lack to lack of tools, lack of proper visibility into it, and really changed the entire operations management and how our communications between HR and legal to get that e-discovery tool and get them actually on the same page as us so we could present data in a way it sense to them instead of days of having to show reports and log lines that translate well into their world. Um, by the way, audience, um, as you're hearing these um, detailed uh, case studies, um, please do uh, type in your um, questions you may have uh, for the panelists here. It looks like we will have some time um, questions at the end. So thanks for that uh, great anatomy of that internal threat uh, investigation around uh, the theft of intellectual property, um, which probably happens a lot more than uh, and you want to admit in our uh, organization. Uh, let's move on to uh, Johnson, um, and he'll walk us through an anatomy of a large, complex e-discovery um, matter. Uh, John Wilson, the state first. All right. So I guess, you know, I, I want to fable in that, uh, you know, in 2016, data sizes, have gotten very large. Everybody knows hard drives have gotten large. But also standing custodian, uh, an average user in a corporate email environment receives anywhere between 40 to 50,000 emails a year. A level user is probably close to twice that. And you know, those that, that that's that large amount of volume just in email. Then talking about Smartphones, you know, smartphones now you can have smartphones that have 64 to you know 500 gigs data, and images that your millennials that that work for the various organizations, they do a lot of things by text, and uh, those are probably very conservative. 85 text text messages a day is a low number for an average millennial employee. Um, very low number, but that's you know overall across your whole organization. You got thumb drives. Obviously, you can have thumb drives that are no bigger than the tip of your finger, and they hold 256 gigs a day. But most uh, people don't think about when they're thinking about litigation and cases is the social media and the interaction within an organization and people that are representing your company that are you know, carrying on chats on Facebook or you know chatting with customers or with other employees within the company and, and actually getting work done. And, and most the, your, your average user in the workplace has five or six social accounts, and they're sending 30 to 100, hundreds of messages a day on each of those platforms. And 
that brings together this whole picture of volumes of data and uh, the case study here. You know, we're talking about a, a large metropolitan transit authority. There's multiple internal agencies. You know, it's broken into small you know uh, departments, and um, was involved in half billion dollar litigation. We had 850 plus custodians that needed to be collected from, and if we would actually collect all the data in a traditional forensic sense from all of those custodians, we had over byte to a petabyte and a half of data that would have to have been processed and analyzed, and then uh, that's a lot of data to chew, and that's more crazy when you start talking about getting into the review of that data and involving the attorneys to do that review. We had to really get creative with our workflows and figuring out how we were going to deliver what needed to be delivered for this case. We had the defense spoliation claim as well as then get documents delivered to the opposing side within the constraints of a court mandated uh, delivery time period, which was under six months. So it became really critical that you had to preserve just of data for each custodian. So we actually started doing custodian interviews and we started figuring out, out hey, where do the custodians have their data? What kind of data do they have? And then starting to apply those technologies. And we really needed to get into the, the using the fuzzy hashing to start saying, hey, just finding duplicates isn't going to reduce the population enough. It's not going to get us from a petabyte and a half down to, you know, 200 terabytes or 5 terabytes even. So we start getting into it. You know, we need to start doing some fuzzy hashing. We need to figure out, hey, is this document pretty similar to that document to identify what the differences are and determine what we need from there. And then a big part of the spoliation claim actually had to do with four custodians out of these 800-plus custodians using social media to communicate about, about route closures and things of that nature within the transit authority and dealing with those issues. So I hadn't even thought of social media really being a key factor. Started delving into it. We discovered that, the, hey, they were communicating using social media, so they were sending Facebook messages to the guy on the other end of the line to say, hey, we're going to have a closure from here to here. and we want going from four custodians that we uh, identified as the key people with this social media data to actually having to wind up collecting social media from 100 custodians. That volume wow. of data. Oh, go ahead. Wow. That's huge. <laughs> and, you know, and, and it was something that was never even thought of uh, um, on the front end of the case side. You know, they're, they're assuming that the employees had sent emails to say, hey, we're going to have a route closure or whatever the case may be. And, you know, it was only through the uh, strong investigative work and building those strong workflows to really limit that data, start building those maps of who was communicating to who and what kind of data really was relative to the matter and getting that data to be proportional to make sure that we're getting the right amount of data that meets our case needs and that it's all relative. We're not capturing hard drives. When you have 800 custodians, you can't capture whole hard drives. You just don't have that luxury to get that data collected, processed, reviewed. And on the more relevant, more targeted collections of the highly relevant stuff, sounds like what you're saying. That is correct, yes. We had to focus, uh, you know, apply proportionality rules and then start looking at really relative only to finding very specific keywords building those heat maps of all the keywords within the case and start to identify those really relative keywords and pull it down so that we actually reduced the total data set that had to be collected and analyzed for the case to under 200 terabytes. Yeah, yeah. That, that, had, that, that had to be reviewed. <laughs> right, and you was still... Tar, was TAR used at all Technology review, two hundred was technology assisted review used at all um, on that still very large uh, corpus you had. After that, uh, 
the the tar was used after the culling, after we got it down under that 200 terabytes, because again, so still, you know, it was exactly legal statement to me was, you know, 200 terabytes is still a lot of data. That's a lot of documents. What are we going to do? You know, we, we've got nine days to respond here, and that's where we then had to go into using that technology-assisted review to further refine and really pull out those relative sets of documents. Uh, I see people um, use TAR in combination, like it sounds like you did earlier, with deduplication and keyword searching um, and that kind of thing. Um, it gains more credibility, uh, TAR, that is. Um, in legal circles. I think very big law firms um, helping clients in massive, large, and complex um, litigations uh, are more apt to be adopting technology-assisted review, machine learning in review, um, and the, um, the rest of the uh, legal community is coming along. Um, big fascinating. Um, I know that we, we, had a, we did a survey recently that we had um, over 100 global law firms what were sort of the hot e-discovery issues that they we're on the watch, if you will, what's, what's, what's out there that they're still being through and concerned about. And one, of course, was more devices. Um, we've touched on just all the, the volume data that's even on a single device that you have to preserve, collect, and then analyze. And all number two was social media. Uh, John has just been touching on here um, that, that need to um, mine um, all sorts of different data types like social media for insights on particular cases. And then the last one was the Internet of Things. Uh, which is certainly on the horizon and um, complicates uh, digital investigations and collections as well. Um, I want to this time invite um, uh, the other panelists. Uh, since Jolson has just finished um, his case study, I wonder if uh, John Grimm or Jason um, had any comments on it or, or maybe an idea popped for you as walk us through this uh, large complex case. Uh, Grim, any thoughts? If not, um, back to the uh, Jason's presentation there with that very interesting case study on uh, actual property theft by an employee. Um, Grim and, and John Wilson, as, as you have looked at you know, similar um, investigations, um, did anything pop for you uh, in this particular one or areas? Um, where you see what's working, what's not working in these kinds of HR investigations? This is John Grimm. So um, these sort of investigations obviously are a bit different than data breaches because um, it's primarily going to be uh, uh, are illegal, but adding up these types of incidents. And I found that working with these incidents um, got to really uh, understand uh, what the objectives are. Um, one of the things that you can do to help you, uh, obviously, aside from identifying which uh, data devices are in scope, is, is a time frame to look for. Um, what is the time frame of suspected activity that that will rule out? You um, can do timeline analysis of the endpoint systems and the logs. Another thing, too, is to get a good listing of keywords that are relevant to that particular uh, investigation to that employee um, coming or names of particular proprietary information, products or devices or whatever that are involved. Um, those kind of things, um, those words can really help you narrow down on things. Um, really, you're not looking necessarily at malware. Um, you can use techniques to find malware. What you're looking for is, is actual information that was potentially um, uh, traded out of the environment. But the, 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 so identify what systems you had access to, to include, you know, social media accounts, uh, emails, mobile devices, uh, endpoint devices, file shares, uh, fuck that time frame of, of suspected activity so that it can help you narrow down and limit uh, or, or first scope uh, what you're looking at. And then that, that nice tight keyword list that you can use to run against those um, evidence sources. Uh, and again, you need to really work with uh, HR and, and legal for um, assistance with uh, a lot of those of the things that you're going to be doing. Thanks for that perspective. Yeah. Just John Wilson, I was just going to add, you know, one of the key things that 
I, I've seen in you know these, especially these kind of investigations, is your data breach, your data compromise can, can be in the megabytes. It can be tiny, but it's information. So you got to keep that in mind when you're talking about. Now we've searched and index a uh, hundred terabytes, and you're looking for terabyte compromise. Uh, some really advanced uh, work and some great policies, procedures, and knowledge of your data to mitigate risks. Fred, well said. Um, before we leave um, your wonderful case study here, was there anything thing else that you wanted to add on this particular case study? Uh, in particular, I mean, again, I, th I think the biggest thing that was is the lessons learned. You know, the incident is itself, but, you know, learning where you can improve after each incident is, I think, one of the things that you can improve your uh, stance every time is uh, just to make sure you get away from that, uh, how to do better in the next one. Right, and, and give me um, kind of the latest um, response and forensic investigation technology working for you. I, I take it was kind of a takeaway to we invite the audience to um, any questions or um, getting a little bit of feedback that maybe we needed to speak up that wasn't quite as loud, but that may have been limited to a few participants, by the way. Um, but please do um, send us um, questions um, if you have any for, um, for the speaker here. And I think, um, Terrell, why don't we also um, get um, Jen and John Wilson to on any thoughts they had as uh, John Grimm um, walked us through um, this uh, kind of a content management system related to um, robbery on the high seas. Uh, you know, again, another big takeaway uh, there that, that jumped up for me was interviews, and that is so often overlooked uh, in digital for HR matters. Um, but talking to people involved in a case and that had hands-on touch, but, but then taking that information, not having the interview just to have it, but taking that information and digitizing it, putting it in, setting up your keywords and your parameters around a case and where those breaches may be, using that information. Then they, they, the interview gets done, and it's just a documentation of, hey, this is where they stored stuff, but they never actually digital information and turn it into intelligent assets to help you solve your case. It's often overlooked, isn't it? In the world, of so really important of sitting down um, face to face interviewing custodians or uh, potential actors um, about where their data um, reside, um, kinds of activity they were under, um, and use that in, in complement with. with uh, scanning across um, their uh, network shares, their computers, um, thumb drives, et cetera, to identify custodians, also identify where their information is. It's very good to combine the two. But somebody else has a thought there, too. Please go ahead. Uh, listen, I was just also going to note on his, uh, you know, if it's a thing of difference, having the right tools in the right place, you know, being able to, uh, having about how to properly deploy those extra technologies at the right time to, uh, really help investigation along without having tons of data just constantly being wasted, I think makes a difference in knowing what tools you have, when to deploy them, and when to uh, let them sit it out. I think it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Another question that we often get here at Access Data, um, Jason, I might um, talk to you, and, and certainly the others can be welcome to talk about it too, and that's corporate digital um, forensics to learn from uh, law enforcement. Um, certainly what comes to mind that I'd be interested in your take on, and this would apply mostly to very large organizations, by the way, but I've, I've heard a very senior um, person at um, a large law enforcement uh, di crime, digital crime lab make the statement that um, the days of one hard drive and one examiner are over, that there that is just everywhere, um, and it can be stored on Google searches that we've done for our entire life. And, you know, store in our thermostat or even um, voice hold TVs, record chat if you're sitting in the living room. Um, this whole end of things and this explosion of data types we've been talking about, 
it really calls for a new approach. He calls it a team approach because there's just too much data. Um, and they look to ways to the team of examiners um, to make amends to collaborate, to shift resources as needed. You take the internet history, I'm going to parse down into this mobile phone data. Um, you just in your thoughts on um, where this new breed is going as part of a team, um, given all that we've talked about with these massive data types. Uh, Jason, others? I think that's an because, you know, when I started out in forensics, it was very much that one man, one computer. You went and captured a hard drive and, and, and made a report. I think, the, you know, being able to notice that the, the world is shifting, and I mean, I, I personally do use uh, a team of investigators. I mean, it's just gotten too big for me to handle. I can't handle, you know, the whole, whole of cloud drives and all their data and all their and social media and all their and being able to look at law enforcement for some of the trends they're seeing and also, you know, I think it's been a lot of give and take between law enforcement and the forensics community over the years. You know, they've learned a lot from the corporate world and corporates weren't learned a lot from them. But I'd say that, you know, they they have given us some uh, interesting insights in some of these recent cases on the internet of things and stuff and places that we need to look and the way to shift as a corporate investigations group away from that traditional and even away from the little bit newer into that cutting of the Internet of Things, the clouds, the, the thumb drives, the ubiquity of our, our existence between our phones and our laptops and our, you know, our TVs and how all that plays together and all the data pieces that we're missing in between that can completely change the course of an investigation. Yeah, I mean, it all, that totality and geospatial information and all that, um, mine it for data and to respond to managed risks, such as what we're talking about here. Um, other thoughts on what we were just about from the other panelists and back to this breed um, and even what you might see on the horizon or what additional challenges um, do you see coming to this new breed of data hunter? Uh, John Wilson again. Uh, you know, two things that I would comment on are mobile phones. Uh, you know, there's thousands of new mobile phones introduced every year. So by a team approach is absolutely necessary because there's just much that uh, there's too much for a single person to know. Um, you, you need balance strengths and weaknesses, and you know, a team approach that can cover the breadth and width of you know that you're involved in. And then secondarily, uh, just new tech, uh, you know, Bitcoin investigations, Bitcoin traffic uh, is certainly going to be of or really blockchain, but Bitcoin and blockchain uh, are certainly of extreme interest in the uh, coming years. Even as healthcare and insurance starts using it to manage their transactions and the transfers, um, I, I foresee that it's going to be a very uh, prolific, growing area. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, the financial um, services banks seem to be exploring and moving in towards using. Um, the blocking um, technology, which would eliminate a lot of sort of intermediaries that data passes through, where there's sort of a potential uh, small group of people who can uh, exchange um, monies, if you will. Um, yeah, that's that's coming. Um, other other thoughts um, from uh, John Graham or uh, uh, Jason, and I I think that we'll also um, I don't know if you guys wanted to comment. Um, on the last subject, but I also think we could move to um, maybe, maybe leave the audience with, um, you know, one or two um, best practices for them, kind of a, almost a summary observation of how this, these investigation teams uh, are evolving inside corporations, how the demand for their services is going from HR and legal and compliance and audit um, as, as organizations are swamped with, with the types um, what do you what do you want to leave the audience with? And um, maybe we'll maybe we'll go down Graham um, and ask for your your uh, observations, John. Uh, data breaches, cybersecurity incidents, um, and that's an IT problem war. They're uh, a problem and a burden that needs to be shouldered by multiple stakeholders. So I guess my parting advice would be to know uh, who all stakeholders are, their roles, responsibilities, and authorities. Um, train together, have a response plan, test that plan, uh, and 
identify any gaps, um, those gaps, and keep uh, updating that plan and making sure that everybody is on the same sheet of music should uh, occur. Great. Thank you. And Jason, um, what's good to you? I gotta say again, the, the key takeaways from mine were definitely tying to the uh, gotta agree with documentation, keeping your policies and procedures, but also have, um, one of the we learned is uh, practicing, you know, top exercises, working through it, but not just within IT, but bringing in the HR and the legal components, so they know how to actually physically do the process when we get to them, not on paper. Thank you. Yeah, Please I mean, give us your thoughts. Yeah, my big thing um, is companies today still don't understand where their key data is. Um, just, you know, they think, oh, it's all an email or it's all on our file share and data is on phones, it's on computers, it's on the Internet of Thing devices, it's everywhere. And so a company really needs to, especially as a company grows, it really needs to assess and evaluate where their data is stored and how they're storing it and how they're managing that because you know, those devices have much lower security levels. And, and all of a sudden you find out that your customer account information is on your mobile phone. That he did, and somebody has now published it all out to the world. Boom, it's scary. Isn't it? I know there was a statistic that 48% of BYOD of these um, stable security settings on their mobile devices without the company knowing was to your point there. I want to thank our, our wonderful um, panelists, John Grimm of Verizon, uh, John Wilson of eDiscovery Squared, and uh, uh, their pictures here, Jason Britton um, of iHeartMedia. Um, thoroughly enjoyed um, hearing your insights and discussion. I hope the audience uh, enjoyed and benefited from it as well. In closing, um, we're, um, we're here to access data to provide um, forensic solutions for complex investigations and sort of heavy, large-scale e-discovery, um, helping our clients solve the, some challenges that were discussed today. Uh, with that, I'll ask the host if there's any uh, other housekeeping um, to be done. Um, otherwise, I think we're done. And thank you so much uh, for joining us for this discussion on the new breed of data hunters. And thank you to our speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, that completes this webcast. You may now disconnect your lines. Thank you, and have a wonderful day.